How many are ready to study the Word this morning? The title of the message is You know, we have a shortage of men between the ages of 20 and 50. So poor Brian's having to wear multiple hats. But let's give him a round of applause because isn't he doing a great job? You just received your reward. <laughs> the title, the new modified title, which you have to uh, close your eyes to see. Close your eyes to see, you get that? Meaning that you hear it is the charge in your life journey, charge in your life journey. And we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get into the explanation of that, but what you should take away from this message today is, is that we as human beings are on a journey through life, and that life journey can take multiple twists and turns. Some of your life journey will be just as a human being. Uh, things happen by chance and circumstance. Then there's times in which your life as a believer, uh, where you should have your life led as, as a believer and led it through God's instruction and through his word and, and moved by the Ruach HaKodesh, by his Holy Spirit, uh, gives you guidance through your life. As you go through the wanderings in your life, and then also through those wanderings, you also go through um, uh, encampments. And uh, the message this morning talks about those encampments. And, and in Bami Bar, the book of Numbers, this last um, uh, parasha, it's a summary of the children B'nai Israel's journey. Misei, uh, Misei is journeys. And this uh, book of Bami Bar, the book of Numbers, is the last book, is the fourth book in the Torah. It is the last book of God's instruction to Moshe. As we go into Davarim next week, uh, and I believe we have a bat mitzvah service for next week, uh, where, where Kylie is going to um, be observing her bat mitzvah next week. Um, that we enter into Davarim, which is really Moshe's words and instruction to the children of Israel as to what's happened over these, these years of his guidance and, and as a mediator with God through with the children of Israel. But this is that fourth book, that last book in the Torah that God had instructed Moshe to write down. It summarizes, the parsha for this week summarizes that route that they followed, the wanderings that they went, the encampments that they contained, uh, until they stood, uh, from the time of the Exodus, until they stood on uh, the point of crossing over into the Jordan to enter into the Promised Land. And this uh, uh, listing, or this, this um, uh, diary, if you will, of what they did throughout that time, uh, really talks about their wanderings in the wilderness for 40 years. And yet, even in that wilderness wanderings, they experienced extended times of rest. They, they experienced extended times of rest. And there were four, 42 encampments listed. Some of those 42 that are listed in this week's parasha, uh, and how many read the parasha? 42 of those that were listed. Some have meaning behind them, and some you won't find uh, any mention or any, any lesson learned as a result of that, but they're still all listed as God had instructed Moshe uh, to write them down. And he kept this journey for a purpose, and it was to be given um, to the children of Israel as, as guidance along their life's journeys. And it is those times of wandering and encampments and, and looking at these journeys uh, that uh, we begin to see a, something emerging, and that is, is that uh, sometimes these journeys that the children of Israel would go on ended up in, in stopping in an encampment, and then after that encampment, uh, they would move on. 
And there was things that happened during that time which would cause them to move and it, and it caused them to stay. You know, it, it, it sort of a, reminds me of, um, of a cruise. Uh, some of the ladies and, and gentlemen in the congregation will go on cruises. I experienced my uh, first cruise. Uh, um, uh, the future cruises are yet to be determined. Uh, but I experienced my first cruise um, in, in my life, and it wasn't on my bucket list. Um, but it was, a, it was an experience. And, and that experience is going out and almost like wandering. You know, when you're out on that ocean, there's, you don't see any land. Sometimes they do it at night. And then the next day you wake up and miraculously you end up in a port. And you, you rest there for a while. And you go through and you, you experience things that you haven't experienced before. That's an example on the sea of uh, what it was like for the children of Israel in the land. Except the difference was... Their captain, uh, unlike the ship that guided us uh, all along to our next encampment, um, their captain was, was driven by the people observing and reacting to what God did in the form of clouds either moving or resting uh, and uh, fire by night, a pillar of fire by night, which either moved or rested. So we see here where there's differences on your life as a human being, your physical life, and then the life, a spiritual life. You know, uh, you, can, you can follow your journey through life uh, at your own direction or your own guidance, or you can allow God to influence you uh, in, that, in that process. Um, I know Ribbetsin Yvonne used to say when she, she would go on mission trips that, that there would always be a, a, a divine appointment. Uh, may not know what it looked like, but when you ended up at that encampment that they would journey to, uh, there would be something that would happen. And so, so you never know what that experience is or what the significance behind um, that visit is. Let's turn uh, for a moment um, and turn to Shemot chapter 13, verses 17, 21 through 22 to talk about uh, these encampments and about the journey and how they stopped at encampments, uh, and how the starting and stopping of their travels were driven by God. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest bear adventure, the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. Now, the reason, the reason that was necessary is because right out of the Exodus, out of Shemot, they had been prisoners, they had been under bondage, they had been slaves, so they really didn't know how to deal with confrontation because they were, they had a, a master over them. So God in his divine way of protecting them allowed them to go on a path that kept them from experiencing any war initially until they could transition into it. It's much like a bird, uh, when you, uh, you have a, a bird that's been in a cage its whole life and you open that door, you have to coax it out. Uh, there's, there's a safety there. And, and that's what God, in, in dealing with the, the physical element of the children of Israel, is doing in this, this explanation of this process. Now let's continue on with verse 21 and 22, which says this. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now this was, once again, a divine miracle that allowed for guidance. This is God's GPS of today back in, in the day of the wanderings. Because they would watch that. They, would, they didn't have a voice like we have, a monotone voice um, that we have on our, on our maps and our cars that tell us where to go. Actually, I heard something that was interesting this week that I never even thought of, but the generations today that have come up don't even know what a physical map looks like. Don't even know what to do with that because they're so used to following um, the, the systems that we have today. So God creates this divine miracle of allowing, by giving instruction, that they're all to follow the cloud and they're to follow the fire. Now, what's interesting is it's like an incense. It's, it's like something that's held up above everyone. It was easy for everyone, all the masses of the children of Israel, to actually see 
what direction God wanted them to go. So the initial charge was that you were to follow the cloud by day, you are to follow the pillar of fire by night. They had experience on the pillar of fire, didn't they? Because that pillar of fire protected them, didn't it? So God even gives them an experience up front that there's protection in that pillar because what did he do? When the, when the sea parted, what happened? There was a fire that kept separation between the, the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians, and them till they crossed over, and then, then disaster occurred. So you see, they crea God created this miracle that allowed for them to have a reliance upon what they saw in the darkness. And then he also gave them guidance on following the cloud um, by day, um, where God's presence dwelled. And, and they were instructed to follow these two miracles on their journey through the wilderness. So that sort of sets the tone and, and, and the, the, the dealing with the physical components of, of this journey that they were going on. Now let's see how things work. Turn with me to Bami Bar Numbers chapter 9 verses 15 through 23. And let's listen to what is talked about here. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. And so it was, when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents, and according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And so it was when the cloud abode from even until the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed. Whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Or whether it were two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents, and they journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. In the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents, and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So now we see how we see some action occurring. We explained the different components. We talked about this is the journey of Israel, uh, the children of Israel through the wilderness. We talked about how they moved. Um, we talked about God's intervention along with their physical experiences and their, their spiritual experiences. Um, but now we see uh, verse 23 in chapter 9, which says, At the commandment of the Lord they rested in the tents, and at the commandment of the Lord they journeyed. So God had instructed them to follow certain uh, divine miracles, uh, and that that would get, get them around. And they, the children of Israel, kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moshe. Now what that means is, is that Moshe, they were instructed by God. Moshe was writing it down in a diary as he was told to do. But really what validated God's instruction and God's commandments and the things that he told them to do was what? Action on the part of the children of Israel. God could have spoken and said, okay, uh, I want you to follow the cloud. But if the cloud went over there and they didn't follow, what happens? They weren't taking charge of what God had said. Or maybe the fire moved and they didn't do that. So, so we see where the children of Israel kept charge. And by keeping charge, they validated that they were following God's instruction. And it was recorded in the diary that Moshe wrote. All of that was an ex as for examples for us as we go through our life journeys. We can tie a correlation, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, about the correlation of their journeys to our journeys now that we are where we are um, in this life cycle and on God's timetable. So we see here that charge is important. I'll give you an example this week. This wasn't the message, and Ribbon Cena Vaughn will verify this, this wasn't the message that I was going to uh, preach or, or teach this morning. 
Um, I had another message, and it was on judgment. Um, we'll get to that another day. Um, but, but really what changed this was, uh, was an, an example in the news that, that Ribicini Vine I heard this week, uh, toward middle or end of the week, I don't remember when it was. But uh, there was a young girl um, who was uh, from California, and her parents were on, her mother and her father, uh, and they were talking about this young girl because she had been uh, struck on her bicycle when she was riding her bicycle, and she was killed by a drunk driver. Now, clearly that's something that any of us as parents would have a very difficult time dealing with. But as they went to clean out her, her apartment that she stayed at, the mother had run across a makeup bag or something, and, oh, and there was no makeup in it. But what she opened up was there was a, a, uh, a note, and in there was some writing on it. And this was done when she was in high school. And she wrote on this, this uh, tablet of paper uh, the different things that she wanted to do in her life. She had a whole list of things that she wanted to do. And so that kept the mother and father. By reading that and seeing that, that really uh, moved them. It moved them to the point that even though their child could not complete this list of things that she wanted to do, they as parents went and do, did it on her behalf. They went out and did the things. Now, they posted this out on one of those social networks, and guess what happens? All of a sudden, people start hearing about this story they see the list and they begin to do the same thing from the list on behalf of this young girl. Now this is an example, I share this with you because this is an example of the journeys and how the people took charge of what God had told them to do or what God was doing. Distinguishing the example I just gave you from the Word of God, it wasn't an instruction that was instructed by God. It was an instruction by an individual, and yet people were willing to take on that instruction for themselves and live their life out following that instruction. Isn't it a shame? And th that story is very moving and, and it's very touching. But isn't it a shame? that you can't get people to follow God's instruction in their life's journey, but they're more than willing to follow somebody else's instruction on how they should walk out their daily life. This is a prime example of laying the foundation for the Antichrist to show up, for others to be easily follow them instead of following God's instruction. So if you take anything away from this message today, is you need to understand that as you walk through your wanderings in life, as you get encamped at different places, we all experience things in our lives that, that we have to apply God's instruction to as we're going through making choices and determining whether or not this is something that God has for us uh, that is according to His will or it's according to our own will. And there's nothing wrong with walking out your life journey. There's nothing wrong with you having a list of things that you want to accomplish that is your will as long as it doesn't contradict God's will. But you don't know God's will unless you read His Word and are moved by His Ruach HaKodesh. 42 times the encampments or resting in the wanderings were mentioned. So you see the children of Israel, they're going B'nai Israel. They're, they're wandering, they're encamping. They're encamping, they're wandering. It goes back and forth. 42 events. You know, something came to me as, as I was thinking about the number 42. Maybe, maybe you know, what... Why was it 42? Why wasn't it 43? Why is it 41? And, and so I looked to see it at, at different examples uh, that, that ancient sages, uh, uh, rabbis had talked about, about the significance of, because there's always significance behind everything that God says. But the thing, a couple of things that really struck me was, was the menorah, how it's six candles and one which is a shamus candle. You know, so there's six candles and one more adds seven. 
And six times seven is what? 42. It also, isn't it interesting that, that uh, what came to mind was that six days God labored. And then on the seventh day he rested. Six days of labor, one day of rest. Six days of wandering, one day of encampment. Six times seven is 42. Now, we're not into numerology. We're not into any of those kind of things. But there are correlations between certain things, which, which allows you to remember those days. You know, you remember six and seven. You'll remember 42. Those things, those are memorials for you to think about so that you don't forget how many times, if there's a question, uh, if we had a uh, Bible um, trivia thing, how many encampments did the children of Israel have during the wilderness? How many would say 43? How many would say 42? Right. So, so there's, there's significance behind that. It's because there's, there's, there's different things that God knows will cause you to remember things um, uh, uh, that are significant or important, not only for you to learn, but then to pass on to generations. Out of these examples, we can see things get, that can apply to us in our lives. As we're walking through our life journey, as we're going through our wanderings, as we're going through um, the things that we experience, as God tells us to rest, as God tells us to, to encamp in a place. And we're supposed to be able to, this is an important point, we're supposed to be able to walk out our lives and enjoy our lives. But in doing so, we're also to not walk it out without God's word and without being moved by the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, you can really equate God's Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, to the cloud by day and the fire by night. That those are divine miracles that allow things to happen and, and, and gave the children of Israel some guidance and we have the Ruach HaKodesh, which helps guide us also. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But you can really look at, at the Ruach HaKodesh like those divine miracles of the fire and the cloud. But as you walk out your life, the important point is, is that you're, we are to all enjoy our lives. Things will happen in our lives by chance and circumstances. Uh, just because we're human, those things will happen. But then also, as we walk out our lives, we are to enjoy it but we are to have God's word inside our hearts, in our minds, uh, and we are to be moved by his Holy Spirit so that as we go through our wanderings, we can experience the things in our lives uh, and make choices that are in the will of God and right choices, not bad choices. Now let's turn to the book of Hebrews to take, take this concept further, to take this pattern that appears to emerge out of reading this parasha uh, that begins to emerge out of the Brit Hadasha. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews and we're going to focus some attention on chapters 3 and chapter 4 uh, as references. Turn to me with me to chapter 3 of Hebrews, verses 7 through 19, which really expands upon what we just read in the parasha, but it addresses it in the Brit Hadasha. Uh, that that explains some things that that um, that we that will help us as examples for us in the 21st century. Listen, listen to what it says, verses 7 through 19. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if we will, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provoca provocation. In now, the stop. As you're going through this, remember the things we've talked about. The Holy Spirit is what like the cloud by day and the fire by night. And so we're here, as you go through that, look at the Ruach HaKodesh as that. Look at the Word of God as God's instruction, God's instruction, and then look at the actions of the people just like B'nai Israel, which is us. We're all, all of us that are believers are part of Israel. So let's, let's put ourselves in the same context as we read the book of Hebrews, as our ancestors went through this in the physical, now we need to see the application of it in the spiritual. So put your mind in that context as we read these verses. 
Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it, is, while it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So reading that, we need to jump back into the Tanakh, specifically within the Torah, again, to have a better understanding of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to explain to the listeners or the hearers of the words that he wrote down. Why would they, when they were told to move, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, when they were told to move and wander, why would unbelief set in? And why would this unbelief get a foothold to where it was to the point where they were not allowed to enter into the promised land for those that uh, were participated in the rebellion? Now, remember what the rebellion it was, what caused them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. What was that? It was their unbelief as it related to the 12 spies that spied out the land in Canaan, remember? That's what triggered this whole event of them wandering through the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. So that's that the unbelief component of the 12 spies spying out the land. Joshua and Caleb were the only two spies that, that uh, said that we can go take over the land. Uh, the rest of them rejected as a result they had to wander uh, and be encamped in the wilderness for 40 years. So... Let's see why this happened, how this unbelief could take hold, and how uh, it would cause this, this problem for them. Numbers 14, 26 through 35 says this. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in. And they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise." I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. So they have to wander for 40 years. This is the area that we're talking about. Remember we talked about the charge, that the people were charged, and they, they kept the charge of what God had instructed, and that validated what God had done because they followed God's instructions. Here we see the first event where they don't take on what God says. Now, they were willing to follow a cloud by day and a fire by night, but that's almost like them being in bondage still because they were used to following Pharaoh and all their masters and all that. Now, all of a sudden, 
God, and then God took them on the path to not have to be confronted with any enemies. So now all of a sudden, they have to be confronted with some enemies, and what do they do? Once again, they're fearful and they want to run back because they didn't believe what God said, which was, you can take that land and you can own it. So now all of a sudden, their time frame of learning what it's like to follow God's instruction and be able to follow what he says, taking charge of a different form of instruction that God gives them, uh, taking that charge of what he says and acting upon it is going to take a longer time for them to learn. And part of the generations that were there would perish in the wilderness because they would never learn. They would never learn to make that transition. Wandering can be dangerous. Wandering and encamping on your own terms can be dangerous. You don't want to wander throughout your life journeys. You don't want to encamp within your life journeys without the Word of God with you. The Word of God is something that gives us our roadmap. It gives us our instruction. The Ruach HaKodesh moves us and gives us guidance. And we're to take that as we walk through so that we know we are in God's will and our will doesn't contradict what God's will wants in our lives. Is everyone following this? Okay. Now let's continue on with Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, which says this. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which were believe, have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on, the, on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth, that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest... He also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So what the writer of the book of Hebrews is doing here is relating this new idea that Yeshua is the fulfillment of Scripture, that the Messiah has come, and that we are to accept this commandment of God that was fulfillment of prophecy and that the children of Israel, the Hebrews, should follow it and that they should take charge of it and that they should follow God's instruction and not go against God's instruction through unbelief because the unbelief will cause those that don't believe in Yeshua to perish, not enter into the rest. And so we see a parallel between what's spoken of here and the wanderings and the encampments that happen for the children of Israel. This is a new concept. And just as God tried to teach a new concept to the children of Israel and it took longer, God's trying to, the, the writer of Hebrews is trying to do a parallel comparison between them and what has just happened with Yeshua and what Yeshua did and how now uh, the belief in Yeshua is expanding throughout the world through the gospel and that they should grab it, take charge of it, and, and believe it because this is something that God is giving new instruction for th their life's journeys 
and our life's journeys also. Now, wanderings can expose violations of God's word. Wanderings also is a time for um, uh, correcting. It is also a time for uh, resetting your compass. Sometimes um, uh, there's wanderings can expose not only violations of God's word, but hearts that are driven the wrong way. And on the flip side, you can be strengthened as a result of your wanderings um, through spiritual exercises that you go through uh, on your life journey as a believer. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, which says this. For bodily exercise profiteth not little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that, is, that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, specifically of those that believe. During these times of your wanderings, of all of our wanderings, and even in the encampment times, we can experience God's discipline. We can experience it because there may be a, a choice that we made that's not according to God's will. Uh, there may be those that are in a re have a rebellious heart and they need to repent, teshuvah, and come back to the word. This is a time of, of maturing, and it also... Uh, causes you to choose between allowing God's word and, and being sensitive to the spirit uh, of moving in your life uh, to guide you along your path that keeps you on a path that leads to righteousness. Now on the flip side, I know that actually somebody shared with me couple weeks ago something about well if you don't if you don't read the scriptures then you're not going to be held accountable for what you don't know I mean that's a good concept but it doesn't work that way so we're on the flip side if you know that you're going to maybe experience some some proving or testing or or uh, uh, some some guidance or, or lessons learned that God wants you to learn as you walk your your life cycle out don't Avoid those kind of journeys or those wanderings, but, but be confident to know that when you come out on the other side, it's like refiner's fire, that you are getting better. You know, for those of us that get older, certain things are easier because we've experienced more. We've seen more. We're able to address issues that if you, if you brought it to a younger person, it may be very difficult for them to handle, and yet as you're older and you've experienced things, it becomes easier. In our spiritual life, a lot of times that's the same thing, that we've experienced a lot of things that we know what to do. We know when to go to prayer. We know, know how to address. We know how to act. We know when to be silent. We know what kind of actions uh, should be done because uh, the Ruach HaKodesh quickens our spirit and we have guidance from his scriptures to give us direction on what we should or shouldn't do. Hebrews 12, 1 through 14 says this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had, fa we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we have them reverence. 
shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth, yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So we see that, that the Father gives us instruction and discipline. And that's for our correction, reproving, and it's because he loves us. So these experiences that we have in our wanderings through our life, our journeys, the experiences that we have um, as it relates to our encampments and the things that happen when we are in that, that time of rest, um, is times in which God's improving us because he cares for us and he's trying to give us guidance and instruction. And, and it's up to us to choose his way. Um, that, that uh, God cares enough for us that if, if our choices, our will, is going contrary to his will, he's going he's to bring it to our attention. So you shouldn't fear God's discipline during these times. But what gets us moving? What gets us moving into the, these wanderings or, or moving on to the next encampment? What causes us, what 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 cloud and what, what pillar of fire gets us moving uh, to the next encampment uh, in our journey through life. It is uh, his Ruach HaKodesh. And it is through that Ruach HaKodesh that moves us, uh, and it moves us to be sensitive to God's word. And that, that God's word comes to our attention as a result of that movement of the Ruach HaKodesh as we begin and go through a new, uh, new chapter in our lives, a new chapter, a new experience on our wanderings or, or a new experience in, in our encampments. 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21 says this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Not any man's will that's ever happened um, it has, um, has been uh, accounted as prophecy. It's only through the movement of the Ruach HaKodesh that prophecy comes forth in any time before, any generations past, and it is through that prophecy that fulfillment occurs, uh, through that fulfillment that we have scripture to give us guidance on how we are to live. But what does this, what does this mean? Can we look to an example that we can have a better understanding of what this means about the movement of the Holy Spirit um, and how it applies in our lives. Uh, what should we look for? How many know that God deals with each and every one of us in different ways? Sometimes you can, uh, somebody, as you mature in the faith, you know when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. As you mature in the faith, you know what certain kind of events will happen that all of a sudden that, that small, still voice comes and you know what's what's uh, what you need to do or you know where to go or what actions to take but what what is it that we can look at in scripture to give us sort of an indication uh, that this is something that act that it that happens today uh, because it happened in the Brit Kadashah after Yeshua did what he did and and uh, was a prelude to what would happen with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts so let's look at an example that sort of gives you an idea of how this really works. And it is an operation as instruction for us. Turn to the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 16 to start. Uh, this is the accounting of the, um, on the road to Emmaus of two of the Talmudim, two of the disciples. Now turn with me to this and let's listen to what's going on and I'll comment as we go through this. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near it and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Now this is, that last verse is significant. 
their eyes were holden that they should not know him. I believe there's an underlying meaning there. Remember, we're moved by this. How many know, you know, in, in, in Judaism, we're taught by the senses, right? And we know the sensitivity of the senses and how God uses senses to teach us. Here they're blinded. They don't see him. They don't recognize him, but they hear his voice. We're not to go by sight. We're to go by hearing. This is the beginning of an explanation of how to deal with the things that we can't see and you can't hear to help build our faith that's talked about in the book of Hebrews. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. Now this is an example that, that has been lost and will be lost if you're not in God's word. And this is a prelude of why many will be misled by the Antichrist because they will be going by sight not going by hearing, they won't be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and they won't be able to listen to what God's words are for them. So it, here's an example on the road to Emmaus where we're seeing them not recognizing them by their sight, but they're listening to what he has to say, that they should not know him. Why? Because if they knew him, it would influence their hearing. If they would have recognized him, they would not have heard what was going on and their unbelief wouldn't have been addressed and their experience and correction and guidance that God was trying to give before the Ruach HaKodesh shows up would not have taken effect. Now keep that in your mind as we read through Luke 24, 17 through 24 and then we'll go on to 25 through 32 because then, then Yeshua is correcting and giving uh, uh, discipline as a result of the actions that are going on. Much like the unbelief occurred with B'nai Israel. These are all human traits that need to be addressed. Go ahead. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and has not, has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Now, we know he's blind. We know he doesn't recognize him, right? By, just by that. If he, knew, if he knew he was speaking to Yeshua resurrected, he would have never talked that way. Go ahead. And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. See, they were looking for a physical Messiah to save them from the bondage of the Romans. They were looking for a physical presence there. That also ties into why their sight was blinded because they were falling in the trap of going by their eyes and list, not listening to the words of prophecy and God's instruction from hearing. Go ahead, continue on. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even, so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Now let's continue on with Luke 24, 25 through 32, which says this. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto him, them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Do you hear and that? He's expounding upon the Torah and the Nevi'im, the five books of Moses and the prophetic writings of who the Messiah was and who it was to come. He's speaking the gospel of Christ. He's speaking, they're speaking out the gospel of Christ, which is true prophecy. Go ahead. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. You notice that? He was almost like, go back to the wandering in the wilderness, following the cloud by day, the fire by night, 
walking down that road. He continues on. What do they do? They call him back. And what does he do? He comes back with them. Why? Because they didn't recognize him visually. Otherwise, they would have continued to follow him. This is the training period that they were going through in this time. Go ahead. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us? Uh, read that again. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? These two men were in the wilderness, but they were moved by God's word, which was spoken to them because they heard it, which was before the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. But we have the Ruach HaKodesh evidenced here by the influence of Yeshua appearing, not being seen, speaking his words, and when he left, what did they say? Did not our hearts, what, burn on what? The way. Weren't they following that pillar of fire? They were being influenced not on a pillar of fire on the outside, but they were being moved by a pillar of fire on their inside. This was a preempt, this was a preliminary example of what was going to happen when the Ruach HaKodesh is poured out upon all flesh. How that, mo that move of God's presence gets implanted in us and causes us to move in a reaction to what we hear in God's word or events that are happening and around about us. But you have to be able to see in the spirit and listen in the physical. See in the spirit, listen in the physical. When they saw in the physical what happened to Yeshua, he vanished. They heard his voice in the physical but they saw in the spiritual because his, their hearts were burning at what they heard. That's the context we have to operate in as we walk out our life's journeys trying to hear God's will and God's instruction for us through his word and through the movement of his Ruach HaKodesh. That's how we are to walk out our lives and being sensitive to God's spirit and being obedient and taking charge of God's instruction and we should live this way of our life until it's our time to go on to our reward John 14 15 through 18 and 26 says this if ye love me keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So we, we don't follow the pillar of, we don't follow the cloud by day, we don't follow the f pillar of fire by night. But we have the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, that dwells in each and every one of us that believes. And it gives us the direction on when to move, when not to move, how to react to circumstances and events, and how we should live out our lives. We should be influenced by God's instruction. We should enjoy our lives. And we should take comfort in knowing that if we mess up, God's going to correct us. But when he, through that correction, we have to have repentive hearts and continue on our journey or our paths. How many have been corrected by their parents, and it was a very difficult time to be corrected, but after you were corrected, you couldn't wait for that to, to have that sort of um, feeling back that, that your parents really cared for you, that they showed after correction, they showed love. That's what God does for us. Uh, and, and, he, and even though he corrects us, he corrects us because he loves us. And this is the instructions he's given us on how we should live our lives. So, in closing, I want to refer to you to the following verses. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. As an example of the Apostle Paul, Rav Shaul, at the end of his life, and how he reflected upon his life. Because at, at the end of our lives' journeys, we all face the same thing. 
and, and hopefully all of us will reach at the end of our journeys as we're standing on that, that crossovering the Jordan into the promised land that we too can stand as Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul did, as he said the following words to Timothy. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation, for he's made us unlike the nations of the lands and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs and our lot like their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven, establishes his earth's foundation, and the seed of his glories in the heavens above, and the presence of his powers in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our king, there is nothing beside him, as it is written in his Torah, and you shall know this day, and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is none of.